Can we say what's up, make some noise for our online family right now? We love you guys. You guys are the best. Uh, so like I said, we are jumping into uh, week four of our series, uh, Rabbi, and we are talking about Jesus. Rabbi means teacher, right? Uh, and uh, Jesus, the teacher, the parables, the stories that Jesus told, uh, a way that he often taught to people, and ultimately a big goal of his, or the goal was, hey, I want you to seek to understand my teaching. I want to teach you something, but I want you to want to understand it. I want you to be willing to go out and to dig in and seek to understand what we're talking about. And so this has been a huge, huge thing. Has everybody enjoyed this series? Have you learned something new in this series? I have. You know what I mean? I've learned a lot of cool things at, at, while digging in. And so I hope you have too, and I hope that continues uh, as we move forward in it. But uh, a new parable today. And we're going to talk about the parable of the two sons, okay? So this comes from the book of Matthew, Matthew 21. And so I just want to read this parable to you, and then we're going to take the rest of the time and just kind of break it down and talk through it. So Matthew 21, starting in verse 28. So Jesus says this to a group of people, but what do you think about this? A man with two sons told the older boy, son, go out and work in the vineyard today. The son answered, no, I won't go. Disrespectful. But later he changed his mind and went anyway, right? Then the father told the other son, you go. And he said, yes, sir, I will. But he didn't go. Also disrespectful. Which of the two obeyed his father? They replied, the people did, the first. Then Jesus explained his meaning. I tell you the truth, corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you do. For John the Baptist came and showed you the right way to live, but you did not believe him. While tax collectors and prostitutes did. Even and, and even when you saw this happening, you refused to believe him and repent of your sins. A lot going on there. And if you've never read this before, you're like, okay, first off, so many questions. Who is Jesus talking to? Why does he seem pretty frustrated and straightforward, right? Because he's like, you, <laughs> there's tax collectors and prostitutes are going to be in a better spot than yours. Like, who's he talking to? Because he's being real with some people. And what is he actually trying to get at in this parable of two sons, one, you know, both, both disobeying their father at different times, right? One up front, but then has some heart change later, and then one at the end, and basically lying to dad up front uh, and, and not doing what he's supposed to in the end. So there's a lot going on, and we're going we're gonna to break this down. And to, to start the breakdown of this parable, I actually want to tell you a story about my son Liam. Uh, so as you guys know, and I'm sure it's on everybody's minds just like it is mine, we're only about six months away from Christmas time, okay? So... <laughs> I'm not the only one, right? Yeah, you guys are like, you're sick. So <clears throat> we're getting there, right, and counting down the days. But um, made me think, as I was prepping for this sermon of this last Christmas, there was a video game that Liam wanted. We have a, a Switch, a Nintendo Switch at home, and Liam loves it. You know, he's, it's his, I mean, it's ours, but he's always like, it's mine. You know, it's like, all right. Uh, and so he plays the Switch all the time. Well, there was a game he wanted for the Switch, and so we got him that game uh, for a Christmas gift. Well, we, because we're super kind parents, we're like, dude, we should take this little chip and put it in a giant box. You know what I mean? And like, you're like, that's awful. Yeah, right? So we took this itty bitty game and we put it in a little box. We thought it would be fun for him to be like, yo, what is it? And then dig in and find out it's this small game. Just kind of confuse him. The more I say it, the more I realize we're terrible parents. But <laughs> so we did that. We put the game, this itty bitty game in this big box, right? And so it was, it was cute and it was funny to see him during Christmas kind of walk by, you know, like, what is it? And just be like, looking at it, thinking about his, uh, his Christmas wish list and being like, what did I ask for that was that big? <laughs> like, just trying to figure it out, just thinking through it, you know, maybe shaking it. We don't know. You know that we do that. I remember doing that when I was a kid, but trying to figure out what it is. Well, fast forward to Christmas, he opens it up, and he opens it up, and he opens it up, and he gets smaller and smaller, and he's like, why'd you use a big box, you know, and it's just this little game, right? And we're like, we thought it would be funnier than it actually is, dude, but yeah, uh, Merry Christmas. So... <laughs> The reason I tell you that uh, is because I think it brings up a, a good point about something that we do. Uh, Liam, as he spent that Christmas season looking at that box, he judged the box by its size. He looked at a big box, and he made the assumption, if it's a big box, there must be a big, great gift on the inside. You get where I'm going? How many times do we judge a book by its cover? How many times do we assume that the exterior must match what's inside? backwards. The interior must match what's happening outside, right? We do that. We assume. And you know what they say about assuming? Yeah. Don't, right? <laughs> Period, right? But we do this all the time. We look at the outside and go, this must be that. This must be what's my circumstance, my situation. This is what must be going on. I don't have all the details, but if I was a smart person, I could tell you this, maybe about my situation, 
Maybe about those people. Maybe about myself. Here's what's going on with me. Maybe about the way things work. Maybe about the way of the world and life itself. Maybe even about this walk with Jesus. Here's how God works. Now we're getting crazy, huh? But we think we know something or someone or, or a situation or a way of life, and we judge the book by its cover. We, we assume based on our own knowledge, and the plain fact is we are often very, very, very wrong, right? What's inside does not match what was going on outside very often. And we're left kind of shocked and shook and going, what? what just happened here? This doesn't make sense, and I'm a little bit confused. So all that to say, I think this picture of Liam uh, paints a good picture of what is actually going on or what Jesus is, is trying to explain in this parable of the two sons. So what I want to do is I want to take some time to focus on the second son, okay? The second son, the one who dad came to and said, hey, go work out in the vineyard. And he said, you got it, dad. And he really didn't. Fingers crossed behind his back, you know? He stayed and didn't go do the work that, got, that dad had called him to. I think that this is a picture of what's going on. That on the outside, he's like, yes, dad, I'll be obedient. I'll respect you. I'll obey you. I'm a good son. But on the inside, something was off. Because did he go? No. Which shows that on the inside, right, the gift on the inside did not match the box on the outside. So just to give a little context real quick uh, so that we can better understand this parable, uh, Jesus gives this, and and, uh, if you read verses 23 through 27 before the previous passage, still in Matthew 21, there's some good context given to who he's talking to, why he's talking to. And so we're going to walk through that real quick. Um, But what's going on here is he's, uh, he's teaching in the temple. Okay, Jesus is teaching in the temple to a bunch of people, and while he's teaching, his authority is questioned and challenged, right? So you've got these religious leaders who come up, these leading priests and elders, and and they ask him, hey, Jesus, why, why do you preach this stuff? Who gave you this authority? Who said that you could come in and do these things, say these things, perform these miracles? If you read through the book of Matthew, Matthew wrote with so much intention on, on the, the, uh, the claim of Jesus as Messiah and, and just how big of a deal that was, right? He comes in and he's like, hey, I'm, I'm the son of man. I, I'm God's son. And, and, and this shakes these Pharisees, these religious leaders. They're like, that's a huge claim. And we don't believe it heresy, blasphemy, all these things, and they just do not like Jesus, right? But he's coming in, and he's stating the truth, and they're not cooking with it. They don't believe him, and they think he's doing really bad stuff. And so they come to him in this specific moment, and they're like, hey, you're teaching here in the temple, but by what authority do you teach this stuff? What backing do you have? And so Jesus responds, and part of that response is uh, the the parable that we just read, Uh, but his initial response before that is actually a question back to these religious leaders, And so if you know these religious leaders and these Pharisees and all these people, one of their goals all the time, because they did not like Jesus, was to trap him. They're like, dude, we want to ask you questions about the law and obedience to the law that puts you in a weird spot where maybe Jesus is mumbling over his words like, well, you, uh, uh, it's like, dude, you're talking to God. You got to, you know what I mean? You're just, it's not happening, bro. You know what I mean? And so they would attempt and attempt and attempt, and it just would never work. Jesus is smart if you didn't know, and so he would just give it back to him. Well, this is a great spot where he does exactly that. And he a little bit just gives them a taste of their own medicine and sends a trap kind of back their way. And he responds with the question himself. So Matthew 21, verse 24 and 25, Jesus says, I'll tell you. So again, what authority do you teach us by? They ask him, I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. If you answer one question, Jesus replied, did John, talking about John the Baptist, did John's authority to baptize come from heaven or was it merely human? Okay, it seems like a simple question. I don't really know how that can be a trap. Well, again, these, these religious leaders, they, they see what Jesus is leaning into. So it points again back to the parable for today and why Jesus mentions John. So again, back at the end of that, he says, for John the Baptist came and showed you the right way to live, but you didn't believe him, right? And so that's pointing back to the parable. And Jesus is answering their question on his authority, but he's making it through the example of John and his authority from God. Okay, so that's something you gotta kind of see in the midst of that. He, he's giving them an answer but he, they don't really see it, right? Because they're kind of blinded by their own selfish ambition and their goals and what they think is right. And so he's like, hey, where did John's authority come from? It came from the Father, okay? You need to understand that. And Jesus is like, hey, so did mine. And it's really what he's, he, he's digging into there. But again, these Pharisees, all they see is their hate for Jesus and they're disagreeing with him and they think that his theology is wrong and he's just, he's committing a lot of wrong things in their mind. And so they're like, 
This is a trick. It's a trap he's trying to get us. And so the religious leaders, they, they, they realize Jesus' question was that. And so they start talking amongst one another and they say, hey, one, if we respond and say that John's authority came from heaven, then we look like hypocrites. We look like people who question faith in God, who question God's authority and who he decides to anoint and put blessing and favor and authority on. We can't do that. That's our whole thing, right? It's like, we can't do that. We look like hypocrites. And then there are other things. It's like, okay, we can't go that way. But if we go the other way and we say that John's authority to baptize came from people, there's a bunch of people who like John and believe that he is placed by God, that he's got authority from God to do what he's doing. These people are going to mob us. (laughs) They're going to call us, you know, haters, and it's just going to be bad, right? So they get stuck in this place. They're like, we don't know what to respond. So if you keep reading on, the religious leaders respond simply with, we don't know, right? It's like, wow, these guys don't know. And then Jesus closes after they say, hey, we don't know, and they avoid the the trouble. He says, basically, all right, cool. Well, then I don't have an answer for you either. You don't know. I don't have anything to say to you, right? So again, Jesus just brings in his his authority, his reign, his, his knowledge of, you know, just being God himself and going, I've got this under control. So why does this context matter? Okay, why did we have to walk through that and see the details of what happened before the parable with these religious leaders, this whole conversation with Jesus beforehand? The reason being is because I believe that the context reveals to us that in the parable, what Jesus is trying to show us and what he's trying to show these religious leaders is they are the second son. They are the son who says, yes, father, I will go and work. And they do not. They are the son who on the outside is this big, beautiful box, this great looking gift, but what is on the inside does not match or compare. Does that make sense today? Jesus is like, hey, you're missing it. You've got something wrong in here and you need to recognize that you are the second son. Like the second son, we do this. It's a reality, okay? It's in it. We too are like these religious leaders sometimes. When it comes to our faith in Jesus, sometimes we get caught in spaces. Maybe it's early on, maybe it's later on. I'd say the second is more likely that we get so comfortable in our walk with the Lord. And Pastor, Can- Pastor Tanner kind of talked about this last week that we start missing out on the value of this relationship with Jesus. We start missing out on his authority in our lives. And we as Christians begin to say, I'm a Christian. I've got it. I've got it figured out. I've got it taken care of. I know what I'm doing. My thoughts, my ways are right. I've got this. We begin to check the religious boxes. I show up on Sunday. I sing the songs real loud so everybody can hear me. I read the scriptures. I pray before my meals. Are those bad things? No, no way. But are they the things? Are they what we cling to? Are they what give us the right to be called followers of Jesus? Or is there something more that we're missing? Does the box match what's on the inside? I would say for a lot of us, it does not. For a lot of us, we're missing something. We're missing out on Jesus' true heart for us. The reality of what we're missing is where our hearts are supposed to be. Our hearts are not in the right spot. A simple way to say it, and we see God, he reveals this and shows this and and, and in so many different parts of scripture, our hearts can become hardened. Have you ever been there? Has your heart ever been hardened? Have you ever met somebody who just thinks that they've got it so down that when God comes in and he brings correction or difference than what they expected or what they had hoped for, it's like, no, 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 this isn't the way, Lord. And he's like, who decides that, you or me? Has your heart ever been hardened like that? It's a very real thing today. This isn't just some old Jewish law back in the day thing. This is today. This happens. And it's dangerous. It's extremely dangerous. We are missing something. Our claims of our faith do not match our character. Who we are, who we say we are, does not match who God has actually called us to be. And it's dangerous. So why does this happen? Why do we get to this place where 
The claims don't match the character, and all this is messed up. And I don't know about you guys, but I know for me that, it, that there's been moments where my, and seasons where my heart has felt hardened towards the Lord. And whenever the Lord brings correction, instead of accepting it and receiving it, I become defensive and I become hostile, right? Like, no, 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 that, that can't be right. I know this. I know that. This doesn't line up with what I think it should be. And I get defensive, and I'm wondering, and I question, and I, I get a little frustrated and not willing to let the Lord speak. Maybe that's just me, but it's a real thing. So why do we do this? Why do we respond in such a way like the second son? And how do we get to that place, really, is the question. I think there's, I want to give you three ways that I think that happens. Number one, again, we get to a hardened heart because we think we know best. What the Lord is bringing to us might, might not line up with what we thought the truth was. Does that make sense? Because we have a concept of what we think truth is. Even if we've grown up in, in, in church, even on a passage of scripture that we've read a hundred times, if it has not been submitted to the Lord, we think we know a truth. Right? And we'll cling to that. It's a very real thing. So we think we know best. The second reason, second way we get there, we get a hardened heart because what the Lord calls us to when he approaches us with correction or change or a newness like Jesus did with these religious leaders, we don't like it because it's challenging. Right? God calls us to growth. God calls us to change. God calls us to different. Difference means uncomfortability. Change means uncomfortability. I don't know about y'all. I don't like uncomfortability. I can't even wear a shirt for a day that's too tight. You know what I'm saying? It just gets weird, folks. We don't like uncomfortability. And so when God says, hey, we've got to enter into this place, this season, and it's going to be kind of challenging. Let's do it. You're like, hmm. <laughs> I like easy, Lord. I like my bubble. I like my box. I like comfortable. But is that what God has for us? No. So we get a hardened heart. It's too challenging. And the last reason, I think, is because it means I'll have to question some stuff. Again, same concept as comfortable. But maybe we've been taught things growing up. People said this is a fact. This is the way it is. This is the truth. And maybe as we've grown up, we've started to hear other things. And other people claim, no, this is the truth. And then we've heard other people claim, no, 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 this is the truth. And so we have a responsibility as followers of Jesus to go, okay, they said that's the truth. They said that's the truth. They said that's the truth. What's the truth? God, what is the actual truth, Lord? Reveal to me what the truth is. And that's hard because sometimes we like our truth, right? We like the comfort. We like what we've clung to, and, and, and we feel confident in what we've said is the way. And when God says, actually, it's not, that's hard. And it means we have to relearn. It means the old dog has to be taught new tricks. And that's exactly, somebody barked, it's good. <laughs> that's hard, amen? amen? And we get hardened hearts. Our claims do not match the character, and that's not it. So then what are we supposed to be doing? Where are we supposed to be? What is our heart supposed to look like? Think back to the two sons again in this parable, right? Let me just say this. Both sons were wrong. Both sons are in the wrong. Both sons disobeyed the father, right? You're like, well, the first one got it right at the end, 100%. So we should be like the first one, yes and no, right? The goal should not be to disobey the father until the very end and say, all right, God, I'm ready. You know what I mean? I'm ready to do it right now, Lord. No, 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 no. The goal should be the be to be the best of both. That's the goal, right? Does not mean we will perfectly do it or get it right every single time. But our goal should be, I will trust the father and I will obey the father from beginning to end. That's what I want to do. I want to be in right standing with the Lord from the very get-go to the very end. That should be the goal. That should be the prize we're striving towards. And this is huge. Don't get me wrong again. The fact that, this, that the first son, that, that his life was changed and he, and he went into the field and obeyed the father, praise God. That's huge. Okay? I don't mean to make that less significant or less important. That is, that is a big deal. But it should not be the ultimate goal for all of us. The whole thing should be the goal to truly, willingly, trust Jesus all the way through. So what does it take to do that then, to be the best of both? Matthew 16, verses 24 through 25. This is Jesus talking to the disciples. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. We've heard this. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Amen. What's he talking about here? Jesus is talking about a submitted heart, a surrendered life. To get the best of both and to be where he calls us, we have to say your way. I have to say, God, my life is not my own. 
I pick up your cross, Lord. I follow you and your way. So when you come in and tell me we got to do this, we got to do that, I say, yes, Father, from the very beginning. It's not about me. It's not about my desires. Not that God cares about me. Don't hear. Don't don't miss that. He cares about the, the things on my heart and all that stuff, but he's got what's best. And so I go, Lord, here it is. Here's who I am. Here's all that I am. I will lose my life so that I can truly find true life in you. A submitted heart. That's what it takes. To be the best of both, we have to have a submitted heart. So our big question for today then, and quickly I just want to run through this, is what does it look like? What does a submitted heart look like? A heart that says, hey, I I don't want to be in disobedience like either one of the sons. Ultimately, I do want to end up where the first one landed, but I want to walk this out thoroughly, Jesus, in the way you've called me to. So what does my heart need to look like? My submitted heart. Heart, three things so that I can avoid being the big promising box with a gift that doesn't match inside. Number one, a submitted heart is repentant. A submitted heart is repentant. Proverbs 28, 13 says, People who conceal their sins will not prosper. If they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. This is hard. Right? We, as followers of Jesus, are called to repent of our sins. And I'll just be real, okay? I I think especially when we're a little bit younger and we're growing up, the word repent feels like a gross word to us. We don't like it. We don't like to hear it. You need to repent of your sins. It feels churchy. It feels religious. It is a powerful and beautiful word. It's a big deal. The picture of repentance is surrender. And the good news is with Jesus, surrender does not mean loss. It means gain. And so we say, Lord, I recognize and I confess that what I've done was wrong in your sight. I sinned, Jesus. I did something that was not okay, and I'm not okay with it. I don't want to be in that spot anymore, Lord. I don't want to do those things anymore, Lord. Make me new, right? Change me because only he can. Change my heart. Change my ways. I want to be who you've called me to be, repentance. I want to repent of my sins, so help me to get there, right? It's a two-step process. I admit, I confess, and I submit. I say, have your way. God, I was wrong. Do what you want to do. I am yours, right? Second Corinthian, uh, Second Corinthians 7.10 says, for the, ki- for the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow, but worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. Another way to say this, real repentance reveals change. Real repentance to, the, to, to Jesus, to the Savior, will reveal life change. He's not gonna leave you hanging, Right? Maybe it's a process and maybe it takes time for sure. And that's real and that's, that, that's life, right? That's a picture of what God does. He works over time and he does things in his perfect timing in his way. But he brings change and that's a promise. He brings healing and restoration and grace and forgiveness and kindness and all these things in his way. But he will be there for us. And we see this. We see this picture of real repentance and, and, and a change in the parable of the two sons. The first son, he experienced this. Up front, he's like, no way, Right? acting like a, a first grader whose mom told him to eat some green beans. You know, no. You know what I mean? It's like, parents, you know what I'm talking about. The dinner table gets crazy. It's like, come on, man. These are good for you. But he ends up getting to the place that God wanted him to be, intended him to be, after all. The place that matters most, right where the father had asked him to be. A life change, a repented heart that said, God, here I am, and I'm yours. A submitted heart is repented. Number two, A submitted heart is teachable. A submitted heart is teachable. You're like, hey, that feels the same. It kind of is, right? They do go hand in hand. But there is a difference here about teachability that I think we need to focus on. Uh, Proverbs 13, 18 says, if you ignore criticism, you will end up in poverty and disgrace. If you accept correction, you will be honored. There's another verse in Proverbs that says, anybody who uh, disregards reproof is stupid. (laughs) It's like, wow, you know? But there's this picture painted so much in Scripture where God's like, hey, don't forget to be teachable. Don't forget that there is always room for improvement. Again, not perfection. He's not expecting perfection, but we cannot get comfortable and just go, I'm good enough. I've got it down enough, right? I'm a good enough Christian. Our God never stops. He never stops moving, never stops growing, never stops bringing change. He will always be perfect in the same, but he's got different for us. He's got good for us. And so he calls us to this. He says, enter into this. I've got more. I've got more. I've got more. Trust me in this process. And that's a challenge for us, right? To see and believe that there's always room for improvement. Again, we like the comfortable space. We like the easy space. It says this is good enough. But that's not how our God works. 
right? And this doesn't, teachability versus, versus this repentance picture, teachability is something that we, we can learn in, in, in order to, to avoid making a mistake, right? To say, how do I get better so I don't end up in that spot where I'm going, I messed up? Teach me, Lord. Make me, make me new. Use other people in my life to teach me. Correction, all this kind of good stuff that I need that is healthy for me. What it really takes is humility, right? Lord, help me to be humble in my walk with you, right? Luke 14, 11 says, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted, Amen. right? Being teachable isn't necessarily this one-step action step thing. It's, it's a posture of our hearts. Being teachable and humble is a, is, is a way that our hearts should be shifted and set towards the Lord. So my, uh, my son Liam is, uh, two times talking about Liam today, I realized that, uh, he used to love cars, Lightning McQueen. Come on, we know who Lightning McQueen is, right? He still is a fan of Lightning McQueen. But uh, like before, like he had a birthday, and he legit had a Lightning McQueen costume that was like he was sitting in a car. You know what I mean? That, this man was about Lightning McQueen, right? So I uh, used to watch all the time. One thing I realized, I'm watching Lightning McQueen. If you know the first Cars movie, because it's the best, um, is he is just rude and full of himself, right? Up front, like he's, you know, I'm speed, and he's all about it, and he's like, thinks he's better than everybody else, and so on and so forth, doesn't need his pit crew, just, the dude's not humble at all, right? And then he goes to go to Radiator Springs, and meets Doc Hudson, and he's got to learn some new tricks from this old race car, and he has to be humbled, right, in such a big way, and that's so real for all of us. In this walk with the Lord, we're like, I think I've got to know how to do this whole cruise. It's like, Lord, God's like, hey, man, I got more. Be willing to hear me. Be willing to allow the people around you that I've placed in your life to bring that correction. I, I just finished, uh, I just started going back to school and I finished my first class this semester. And I was like, oh, this should be, you know, okay, it's one class and it was a speech class. And I'm like, dude, all I do is talk. You know what I mean? It's like, this shouldn't be an issue. So I did my speech class. Let me tell you, the Lord was like, yeah, you thought. You know what I mean? It was like, this is way more challenging than I thought. And I had to learn a bunch. And it was just like, but it was great. But it did take the step of going, hey, you don't know it all. It sounds very practical, but man, every day, right? And God's like, I've got so much more. Just be willing to learn from me and from those I've placed in your life. Be willing to understand that there is always room for improvement. It's important. Don't miss out on what God is trying to do in our lives. So again, re repentant, teachable. And the third thing that a submitted heart is, is it's seeking. It seeks. Isaiah 55, 6 through 7, to seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Love this passage. Great picture of, of, of the beauty of what it looks like to seek the Lord and the grace that God gives us as we do, the kindness that he offers as we do, the, the renewal and the refreshing that he offers as we do. Right? I love that. Such a cool thing. But what it really paints is the picture of the importance of seeking our God, seeking his way over our own, being willing to chase after the Lord. We talk about it all the time. God chases after us. Amen. He does the, the, the work and we get to receive the free gift. It's such a great thing. But we have the choice to say yes. We have to make the choice to enter in and say, I want to see your face daily, Lord. I want to seek after you when I wake up in the morning and before I go to bed at night and every other minute in between, Lord. I, I want more of you in my life. God, what do you have, Lord? What are you doing, God? Which way are you taking me? Which way are you taking my family, Jesus? I want to seek your will and your way. I don't just sit and wait necessarily, but I say, what do you have, Lord? Seeking the Father. I think there's this beautiful picture that David paints for us in, in Psalm 63. He says, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh it faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I thirst for you, Lord, right? My flesh, it faints for you, God, earnestly. With, with all that I've got, Lord, I seek after you. I want you, Jesus. How, how many of us want Jesus, right? How many of us should want Jesus more than anything and everything? Again, Pastor Tanner talked on this last week, valuing the kingdom, valuing Jesus and saying, man, you are, you are the treasure, Lord. You and your ways, and it should be everything that I want, and I should seek after that treasure that you are and all that you have for me. I earnestly seek you. Uh, Charles Spurgeon says it this way about this parable and, and this concept of seeking. He says, the second son said, I go, sir, but he went not. And these people do not go, us, right? 
They talk of repenting, but they do not repent. They speak of believing, but they never believe. They think of submitting to God, but they have not submitted themselves to him yet. They say it is time they broke up the follow ground, right? The words, the promises, the big box, and sought the Lord, but they do not seek him. It all ends in mere promise. We've missed it. The outside does not match what's going on, on the inside. Seeking is important because seeking places priority. Whatever I'm chasing after, whatever my focus is on, whatever I'm saying I want more of, that's the most important thing, right? Where are my eyes fixed? Let it be on the face of Jesus. When I seek his face, when I, when I choose him, I'm placing priority and saying, God, you're, you're it. You are what I need. And the rest will follow, amen? The rest will follow and be where you've called it to be. But I need you. I need to prioritize you, God. Seeking requires action. It's taking the step. I'm here, Lord. You're here. And the cool thing, the beautiful thing, God in all his goodness and his kindness and his grace to, to us is when we seek his face, it is not a long journey. He says, I'm here, right? I'm right here. I've been waiting every day. We had a conversation with our students uh, at the beginning of a message a few weeks ago, probably a month ago. And I, and I reminded them that when they show up on Wednesdays and they get in the space and we're worshiping Jesus, he's, he's waiting for us. He waits and he says, hey, I'm here. I'm not going to force myself upon you. I'm not, I'm not going to force this relationship on you, but I'm, I'm ready if you are. Look to me. Hear me. Seek me. And I will be found by you. Right? I will. That's a promise, which we have to seek. We have to take that step. One last thing before we get ready to be done. Um, question for you question for all of us that I hope we take and we ponder on and think on throughout this week. Does the box match the gift? Does what's going on on the outside, is it compare and is it equal to what's happening on the inside? Does it represent the trueness of what's on the inside? Or are they different? Again, not perfect, and I can't push that enough because God does not expect perfection from us. But he does expect a submitted heart. He does want us to submit our hearts to his ways because he loves us and is a good God. Does the box match the gift? Matthew 15, 7, Jesus is talking uh, to his disciples and these other people as well. Again, these religious leaders, he says, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. For he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a, is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. We can't let just the lips honor the Lord. Our hearts must do the same. The outside must match the in. The inside must match the out, both and. We are to be one. Yes. Lord, help me. Let what comes out, God. Let what people see, Lord. Let it not be a farce, God. Let it not be just an image, Lord, but let it be reality for me in my life. Let people look at me and go, now that is a person who follows Jesus. Amen. That is a submitted person heart. Not for my glory, Lord, but so that they would do the same. So they would give you all that they have, God, and submit their hearts as well. Because you are the only way. Does the box match the gift? Can we stand? We're going to pray here together. I just want to remind you of this real quick um, before we close out. In this, in this parable, again, you've got our two sons, and we talked about how both sons, um, they both did wrong. Amen? They both disobeyed the father different times. And again, the first one, praise God. And I do want to focus on that first one for a second. The first son, while he disobeyed up front, ultimately found what was most valuable. He sought the Lord. And I, and I think about that space from when he first said no to the father and the ending where he, he, he ultimately went out in the field and he worked and all that happened in between, we can't jump over that. Because what happened in between is he found the amazing grace of Jesus. What happened in between is he invited God in and he allowed God to begin working on him, changing him, growing him. He started working towards this, this submitted heart, not a work in his own way, but letting God come in and do open heart surgery, if you will, right? And I think it's so important for, for all of us but specifically, I think there's some of us to, to know this, that it's not too late. 
Maybe you're in here and you've been coming to church for a while and, and you're going through the motions and you got church down. You know what I mean? That you can tell that guy goes to church. That's great. But is your heart submitted? Is your heart submitted? And I want you to know that God's grace is so big and so great that if you're missing out or if you feel like you've missed it, if you're coming to the realization that God is letting you know, hey, you, you've missed it. Your heart has been hardened. And, and maybe the relationship with me is not what you thought it was and something needs to change. There is no shame right now. There is no shame in Jesus. He brings no shame when we come to him, when we receive correction. Only grace, only truth, only favor and love and all these things in a perfect way to help us to become who we're called to be. And so I just want to encourage you, give that to the Lord today and say, God, is there something in me? Have I missed it, Lord? Have I missed this? Have I been the hardened heart person who said, I'll do it, Lord. But did I ever really submit my heart to you and say, have your way? It's not too late. And he's excited about it. He's not mad at you. He's excited for you. And he cannot wait to spend eternity with you, to bring change into your life, and to use you to do amazing things. It is not too late. Amen? Can we pray? Jesus, thank you so much for today. God, I thank you that we got to gather as a family. We got to worship you, Lord, because you are worthy of it all. And we got to, got to learn about you, God, and learn from your word. And I just pray that we never stop that, Lord. Lord, let us never stop seeking. Let us never stop being teachable, God. Let us never stop seeing the value of repentance, Jesus, and, and realizing that we get it wrong. And Lord, Give us the desire of what you have for us, Lord. Not, not what, what maybe we want, not what feels comfortable, not what feels easy, Jesus. Just whatever, whatever it may be that you have for us, God. Your will, your way. Soften our hearts, God. Give us the strength to submit. We love you. We praise you, God. It's in your perfect name, Jesus. And we pray, amen.